Thank you. Wow. Yeah, welcome home, guys. Awesome. Wow. Great. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, that event yesterday. We thank you, God, for that service. We thank you. It was so Christ-centered. We thank you that people that don't know you could have listened into that and got a revelation of exactly who you are today and who you were and what you did 2,000 years ago. So, Father, we thank you for that event. We thank you that it remained uh, Christ-centered. We thank you that King Charles III uh, is still a defender of the faith. Uh, we give you thanks for that. We thank you that you gave the Church of England hierarchy the, the backbone to push back on what his original intention was. Uh, so, Father, we just pray into that whole event where millions of people, perhaps billions worldwide, a TV audience, and certainly the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands that received gospel tracts and heard the gospel message tomorrow. Lord, we look, I'm sorry, we look for you, Lord, just to pour out your spirit and water the seed that has already been planted. Even as Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God all the while who gave the growth. So Lord, you're the growth factor, and we believe for growth out of all the seeds that were sown. So Father, let's stand up and let's pray over our king and the queen's consort, uh, Camilla. So Father, we thank you uh, for our king. Lord, you command us to pray for kings and all those in eminent place that the end result of that is that we may pass our lives uh, in peace and in a place where we can share the gospel. So, Father, we pray for our king. We pray for the queen. We pray for, the, the, indeed, the whole royal family. Uh, Lord, we lift them up and we ask God, even as the prayers that were lifted up to you yesterday, uh, that he would find a grace from heaven, a grace in the Holy Spirit to rule wisely and in mercy. So God, we ask him, we ask for him that he would receive a revelation of him who he pledged his allegiance to, a king that transcends every other king, the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, my God, that as you would give that revelation, that he would see a king, a king who died with a placard nailed to his cross saying, King of the Jews. And Lord, that in seeing your kingship, that even our king would bow the knee and that he would give his life to you. And that throughout his reign, that he would come to represent you and your kingdom, even as his mother did. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. amen. And amen. Yeah, it was uh, I had a good pleasure of watching it with Paul and Deborah and uh, another two of our neighbors uh, who are not Christians. It was a tremendous time, uh, two hours. Uh, we were just speechless. I don't be you. I get so emotional in the middle. I thought, what's going on? It's not a marriage. You know, you get emotional at the marriage. But it, it was such a historical event. I think what moved me more than anything else, uh, kind of unexpected, although... Glenn Barrett, um, the leader of the AOG, whose conference we were at all last week, uh, he uh, was there and had to go down for the practice. And when he came back, to take a day out of the conference, when he came back, uh, he was telling us, he says, you wouldn't believe how Christ-centered this is. And he referred to the young boy, the, the choir boy, who came to, in front of King Charles and and said that you would, I can't remember the exact text of the words, but represented the king of kings. And uh, I don't know about you, but I heard several references to the king of kings all the way through that order of service. I, I heard many references to Christ. And the thing that, the thing that got me, that was there were some moments during that service, because of the, the, the centrality of Christ and the, the, the prayers to Christ and you know that the Archbishop offered, that the the focus of the cameras and did were taken off Charles so often that it was really quite easy to see Christ in the middle of all that. At least for Christians, maybe the world was thinking, "What you know? Wow! I thought this was about a coronation. This seems to be about something else." Uh, and indeed, it was because it's a it is a coronational service that has been hammered out over the years and has been the same with minor 
changes for centuries, hasn't it? So for me, I, I thought, wow, this is amazing that here we have the coronation of King Charles III. But you could, and amongst all the prayers, and the, could somebody close that door, please? Thank you. And amongst all the prayers and, uh, and everything else, the praise, the songs, you could catch more than just a glimpse of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And um, as, I, as I watched it and I, 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 was rem I remembered something that Pastor Glyn Barrett, who heads up the AOG, by the way, it was a phenomenal conference. Sometimes I've looked at the, the situation relative to the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Methodist churches, and the, oh, the agonies of splits, and the healthy part goes to another part, and the compromise everywhere. And I don't know about you, but my heart has been so grieved these last few years. There's just one more, one more pile of bad news comes out of the mainstream denominations. Anybody can identify with that. But I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, the AOG Assemblies of God, 600 churches. And man, that was a conference to remember the whole of the Harrogate Convention Center, 1,400 pastors, 1,400 people at that. And the momentum and the caliber of the ministries. I, 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 you know, I'm not an AOG, but man, I was there celebrating with them. I thought, you are healthy guys. I don't have to worry about you. <laughs> My soul was so encouraged by what I saw there. And Julie and I got so much of a touch from God, which I'll unpack uh, in the weeks ahead. But um, just flowing on from, yeah, I'm telling you that because I'm going to weave it into this message. So my message this morning is called the King of Kings, a proper response to him. For, as I said before, anybody watching that coronation yesterday, wow, if you were a Christian, you couldn't help but see the King of Kings, Jesus Christ in it. And hopefully many people in that worldwide audience listening to the text of the prayers and the praise, hopefully God will open their eyes as well. Amen. But it's not just the unsaved people. It's not just the lost of this world that need a revelation of Jesus Christ. Even those of us that are Christians, we need a not a further revelation of Jesus, but a clearer revelation of Jesus, a fuller revelation of Jesus. And uh, this is what I just want to uh, share. And um, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through, in fact, before we go there, could you get your Bibles out, whether they're on the phone? This is not, I didn't give this one to you, Hannah. But if you've got your Bibles on your phone uh, or with you, why don't you open up your Bibles to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to read from verse 10, because this is a revelation of who Jesus Christ is right now. This is who he is. If you could see him, this is what you'd see. And it's kind of different from the Jesus we read about in the Gospels. We see in the manner of transfiguration, we see there his glory breaking out for the three disciples to see. But for the most part, we see Jesus walking those three and a half years of ministry as a human being, just a normal flesh and blood human being, doing a lot of God things, walking on the water, turning water into wine, raising the dead, healing all manner of sickness and disease. But he just looked like a human being. And that's what a lot of people thought. But here... John, the Apostle John, the one whom he describes as Jesus loved, he is on the island of Patmos, a Greek island that you perhaps don't want to go to, although it's apparently increasing its uh, tourist value at the moment, over there in the eastern Mediterranean. He had been banished there because of his faithfulness to the Word of God. The, the devil had tried to shut the Apostle John up, but John just kept preaching. And uh, he ended up somehow getting hauled before some kind of court and sentenced to a certain period of time in exile in the island of Patmos. But here we read this. He says, verse 9. He says, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering 
and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's Day, Sunday, on the Lord's Day, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, this is in my Bible, it's written in red. These are the words of Jesus. Write on a scroll what you see. Let me know the book of Revelation is a whole series of visions. And he says, write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, with a golden sash around his chest. Wasn't Prince Charles magnificent in all his regalia yesterday? Kind of conjured up a memory of Revelation 1 to me. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And coming out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Let's honor the Lord Jesus with a hand clap this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, wow, what a revelation. Amen. Holy Ghost, help us to see Jesus, Lord. Help us to respond correctly. And everyone said, amen. I want you now to go forward to Revelation 19, which will be up on the screen. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. And it says there in verse 11, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. Jesus is faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And it was John who wrote the Gospel of John, obviously. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. Amen. And then in verse 14 he says, and the Word was made flesh. Wow. This is Jesus. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, Followed him on white horses. This is about the second coming of Christ, guys. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Wow. Yeah, maybe some of you got a surprise about John reading out that passage about Ananias and Sapphira dropping dead because they lied to the Holy Ghost. That kind of thing. Wow. Oh, does that fit in your gospel? You see, Jesus is more than just Jesus walking through the fields picking corn. Or what? Jesus is God incarnate. And is God incarnate. Friend, he is the judge of the whole earth. Amen. And he is the Lamb of God who died to shed his blood. That there might be a gospel message. And at the heart of that message is that in the shedding of his blood, 
He paid the price for all our sins because he was judged in our place. And being judged in our place, having borne the penalty for anybody that comes and says, Jesus, I believe in you and I believe what you did. Make it so for me. Bear my judgment, Lord. Thank you. And we get our names written in the Lamb's book of life. And when we die, we go to heaven rather than hell. Because friend, if you die in your sins and you haven't come to Jesus, you're going to be judged for those sins. And the, and the judgment for anybody still in their sins when they go through death's door is when they are resurrected at the last day and come before the, the judge of the universe. Jesus, friend, in his perfect justice, will have to say, you chose to pay the price for your own sins. And the price for paying the price for your own sins is eternal exclusion from my presence in a place called hell. And that's the reality of it. Yeah. Amen. This is why I, th I think when Peter talked about how many people, I think he said about 800 in his little company, but the vast majority were from other countries. Other countries where the Spirit of God is moving. Other countries that may well be in revival. Why was it there were so few from the UK? Friend, if we truly saw Jesus for who he is, we would have, you know, we would in our lifestyle of evangelism be far more with it, far more of aware, far more seizing of opportunities. Do you hear what I'm saying? We'd be thinking about our neighbor. Amen. Could I get them to church this week? Thank God one of our members, two of our members actually have got their neighbors here this week. Wow. But we, get, we need, a, we need a, a, a full revelation of Jesus Christ. So many churches have got this. Just, they just operate in this revelation of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, tiptoeing through the tulips like tiny Tim. Do you, do you know what I mean? And it is such a narrow wave band of revelation. We need the full revelation of this person with whom we have to do. Yeah. Amen. So, what an awesome revelation from the book of Revelation. Of Jesus, of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Glenn Barrett, the pastor I've been telling you about, the leader of the AOG, had one such moment. Not like John. But he had a moment, and it was the moment he received this in the mail. And I wonder if we could project that up, Hannah. This is what he received in the mail, and this is a, a standard copy. It hasn't got his name in it. But he was telling the conference that, you know, he knew he would probably be invited to represent the Pentecostal churches of the UK, that he would probably get an invitation because he'd met the king before. And the king was well aware of Pentecostal churches. He says, you are growing, aren't you? Yes, we are. <laughs> Part of the body of Christ might be declining, but I'll tell you what, there's other parts growing and doing well. Do you hear what I'm saying? And uh, Pastor Glynn, he was telling the conference that when he opened the mail, and, and this is what he found, the coronation of their majesties, King Charles III and Queen Camilla. Now look at this. By command of the king. By command of the king. The Earl Marshal is directed to invite, well in this case it was Pastor Glyn Barrett, to be present at the Abbey Church of Westminster on the 6th day of May 2023. He said when he opened that envelope and he read that phrase, by command of the king. He says there was a kind of moment of, he did, these are not his words, but kind of what I read into his response, a kind of moment of trembling, <laughs> a kind of moment, a, a kind of check and, and what was going to happen and what he was being invited to, a kind of realization of the relationship between a king and his subjects, kind of a reminder of his own relationship with a king of kings because he's a subject and a servant. Are you following me, Ness? And he, he didn't dwell on it, but it really made a, an impact at the conference. I don't think there was one of us kind of, when he mentioned it, there's not one of us thought, 
wow, how am I responding to the commands of the king? How am I responding to the voice of my king, the king of kings? I don't think there was a part, there were 600 pastors there and their wives. They were, the place was packed. Every night it was packed. Every session it was packed. And I don't think there was one of them when he told this little narrative. I don't think there was one of them didn't think about, wow, Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So I just want to talk for a few moments about a proper response to him. Obviously, Pastor Glynn obeyed. I don't know what would happen if he didn't. I suppose he'd probably be able to beg off. But as a Christian, we are taught to honor the king. We are, in those days, they were even taught to honor the emperor. And when you knew who the emperor was at that day, you think that's a tall order. But they were told to do it. Amen. Because it's not so much who's in the office. It's the office itself. That's what we have to pray into. Amen. God can use heathen kings. Amen. So, obviously, Pastor Glynn went along. There's someone else in the Bible. For by John, there's a few actually. But the one I've chosen is from the Old Testament. Someone else who had an unexpected run-in with Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I just want to look at his experience and see how he responded. Amen? That in his response, perhaps we can get a revelation of how we should be responding to our king in any given moment. Uh-huh. In any given time of worship or Bible reading, especially when we hear his voice and the Holy Spirit tells us to do something. Are you in it? <clears throat> so Isaiah was a prophet. Old Testament prophet. He's one of the major prophets. Isaiah was a palace prophet. He was a court prophet. His life for a long time had been pretty comfortable. He lived under the rule of King Uzziah. And Uzziah at this stage had been on the throne for 52 years. Kind of reminds me of Queen Elizabeth. So things had been stable. Things had been very, very prosperous. Uzziah had fought wars and won them. Isaiah had even invented new weapons of warfare. He had engaged in building projects. Things were really prospering under his rule. He didn't end too well because he went into, he got so proud about it that he went into the temple and did something that only priests should do. And despite the fact that I think, I think it was 80 priests tried to talk him out of it, he went ahead and did it anyway. And as he's arguing with them, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Leprosy being a, an outward indication of sin. Amen. I'm not saying lepers are sin. It's just a type and a shadow of sin. Leprosy, yeah? And, um, and uh, he ended up in a palace that was separate. But up to that point, life had been good. It had been good for Isaiah. He, he was comfortable as being a palace prophet. He wasn't like Elijah, kind of living in caves and stuff. No, he was a comfortable prophet where he was. But something happened. Something happened. And we can read about it in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. Let's read this together. And this again is a new King James Version, just for the sake of time. In the year that King Uzziah died, 52 years on the throne, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And in John's revelation, they're still singing it. <laughs> and never get bored of it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. What an experience. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried. Who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. 
Look at his response. Look at his reaction. So I said, oh, woe is me, for I'm undone. Because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. Say after me. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So there, in the year, he loses his security. In the year where there was already clouds of war on the horizon from the Assyrians. There was a whole bunch of stuff going down. And in the year that King Uzziah died, all of a sudden this prophet, his whole world is turned upside down. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of, a, a lot of trepidation of the, about the future. But somehow as he goes before God, which is a good thing to do when you're in the middle of something like that, is get before God. Whether he was in the palace or whether he was in the temple, we don't know. But he had a vision of the king. Wow. And what a vision. What a vision it was. And then in the light of God's holiness, with the sound of those seraphim crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Oh, he becomes so aware of his own sinfulness. Oh, woe is me. I remember the most fearful time in our lives, at least in mine, in church. It was during the 1993 outpouring. And we were having this meeting just to soak up the presence of God, just to be in his presence. And I remember the presence of God was just so, so strong. Most of us were on the carpet. If you've never experienced an outpouring like that, you probably won't get it. But just people were just having visions. People were just worshipping God. Some of them were even like in Acts chapter 2. Some of them looked like they were drunk. They were just so full of the Holy Spirit. And I remember sitting against the wall. I was kind of a fairly small room. It was about 30 of us. And I was sitting just against the wall and all of a sudden I, I just knew something was going to happen and I felt Ooh. and I watched and this wasn't I wasn't seeing in the spirit this happened physically I watched this cloud come from that corner and very slowly move across that room Nobody said a word. Nobody dared. And the overwhelming sense of being in that place with this holy cloud, the manifest presence of God the Holy Spirit, as it slowly went across the floor and out through the door. And my immediate thought was, honestly, my immediate thought was, I'm still alive. You might think that is really strange. But when you have a run-in with the holy presence of God, it's amazing what will come out of your heart and out of your mouth. Isaiah said, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Everybody in that room was so aware of the holiness of God and their own sinfulness. Knowing that he's redeemed us, knowing that we're forgiven, knowing that we were keeping short accounts with God, we were in that place, being right with God, created in righteousness and true holiness, born again. But friend, when that presence came, oh wow, it was pretty different. Amen. And here we see Isaiah having this amazing encounter with God. It goes on. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, which is just flowing on from the previous text. It says, then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. 
And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And friend, somehow in his response, I think we can learn something about how to respond to the presence of God, even if it's not a a cloud that we can see. But friend, in here when we're worshipping, I don't know about you, but I feel the presence of God fill this building. And I know when he does. Sometimes I get a little bit concerned, whereas we've already gone through one song and I don't feel the presence. Amen. But I'm happy to be able to say that for as long as I can remember, God has never failed to manifest his presence in this place. He's always here. Amen. So Isaiah, he gets a revelation of his own sinfulness, but he gets a revelation of God's mercy. The seraphim comes and says, hey, your sins are purged. There he is thinking, I'm undone. But he's saying your sin is purged. Oh, friend, what a relief. What a relief for him. What a relief for us. Amen. That our consciences can be clear before God. And we see in a second scripture here, we see another response. There's one of those towels around. Oh, yeah, okay. Can't see it. My face is leaking. We see here, he overhears this, the counsels of God. And he hears the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He hears them saying, whom shall I send to the nation to prophesy? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And look at his reaction. Look at his response. Hey, here am I, send me. Here, here am I, send me. Somehow, as he stood before the king, the king of kings and the lord of lords, with his sins purged away, he responds and says, here am I. I'll volunteer. I will go. Wow, friend, that's what the church needs. What the church in the UK needs is for so many believers to have that kind of encounter with God. That there would be that kind of response. Amen. I believe God's saying the same thing to the churches in Eastbourne. Who's going to go? To our neighbor, our workmate. Who's going to go? To the person in the queue at Tesco. Who's going to go? Down the street, perhaps, to witness. Who's going to go? But friend, it's, if our response to the king of kings... If our response is, well, okay, I'll think about it. If, if our, you know, it's interesting, by command of the king, how quick are we to respond to the king in obedience? Everybody say obedience. How many of you know that is an easy word to say? Obedience. Obedience. But like Pastor Glynn, when he read that, he just thought, wow, that, that, that makes an impression. But you know, the king has already commanded. <laughs> Our king has already commanded. When he spoke to Moses, he gave us ten commandments. Not ten recommendations. <laughs> he gave us ten commandments. And I know the ceremonial part of the law that that has been superseded by Christ, fulfilling all those types and shadows. But the moral law stays. Jesus says, I have, I've come to fulfill the law. Amen. I've come to fulfill it, not, not do away with it. The Ten Commandments still stand. Amen. It's just for us, we have them written in the tablets of our heart. Our conscience is all the more sensitive because of it. But we've got to realize that that, that God gave Moses those ten commandments. 
how do we respond to those commandments at any one given time? When we're tempted to sin. Do the commandments, does the, does the king's presence and the king's voice and the, and the king's word, does it keep us in check? Or do we just say, oh well. Do you hear what I'm saying? We need to see Jesus correctly to respond to him correctly. Are you with me? By command of the king. Do you remember Jesus came to one guy? It was the guy that was at the pool of Beth, uh, the, the pool of Siloam, paralytic guy. And he, the angel came down at certain times to stir the water, and the first one in would get healed. And Jesus said to him, "Do you want to get well?" Strange question. And he says to him, "Well, every time the water stirred." Everybody piles in there before me. And there's nobody to help me. And Jesus heals him. But you remember Jesus catches him later on. And he says this. Command of the king. Jesus says this to him. Stop sinning. Stop sinning lest something worse happens to you. Friend, when the Holy Ghost convicts us. Maybe not in using those words, but we know it's the Holy Spirit and, and he's bringing conviction to stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Just stop it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I need a course. Oh, I, I need some therapy. Just stop it. Yeah. That's what's missing in so much of Christian recovery programs. And thank God for them. But friend, what will make them work? Is if there's also a revelation that there is a king that they are subject to, who died on a cross for them, shed his blood for them, but is now exalted. He's now ascended and he sits on a throne and his eyes blaze with fire. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And the whole universe, the whole of heaven worships him. And the seraphim are still singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Are you with me? So our response, what is our response to our king when he speaks to our heart? What's our response to his presence when it comes? I remember John, just a couple of weeks back, he was talking about Pastor Suniel's meeting here, where there were real miracles happening on stage. Jesus was at work, but he highlighted the fact there were some people kind of just chatting. Just chatting. Jesus is up here working miracles by the Holy Ghost and, and, and just chatting. Not right, eh? not, not appropriate, I would say. We need to honor the presence of God and teach our children to honor the presence of God. What about, what about a, a, a response to the gifts that He has given us, the, the calling? That he's put in our life. Oh well I'll get around it. What about his baptism in the Holy Spirit. That he personally does for each one of us. What's their attitude to that? Oh yes Jesus Lord I want it. <laughs> God i got to get it. Oh I can live without it. What about our giving to his cause. The Great Commission. It takes money. I don't know how much Peter's initiative cost yesterday. But I'd imagine it cost. Of course, what about a response to his word? Either the written word. Or as the Holy Spirit gives us that rhema word. Where we know he's talking to us. Amen. I remember when I was in Scotland. And uh, as a pioneering. Is that ten part? Oh, goodness gracious. Forget that story. <laughs> Come, let's stand up. I don't know where the time goes. I was going to really self-discipline myself to finish in time. Sorry, Lord. It's, it's, you might say it's okay, Rob. No, it's not okay because I give you a word that this service will run from 10.30 through to 12 o'clock. Okay? You're banking on that because you invited your friends and they'll probably say, well, how long does it go? No, it's, it's a serious thing. It's, it's a serious thing. And they're coming on that proviso. 
If I run over, well, it's like that's a reflection in my integrity. And it might even be thinking, my goodness, that bloke's a bit long-winded. I'm not going to come in back there. <laughs> so it matters. It really, really matters to, to keep time. So my apologies, my, my, my apologies. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your kingship. Thank you for every one of us that's put our faith in your work on the cross and who you are. God made flesh, dwelling amongst us for 33 years, showing us God in your forgiveness of sins, your raising of the dead, your receiving of worship. You showed us God through those three years of ministry. And then you died on a cross. But because you're God, death could not hold you. And because if you died as an innocent man, it was just that you be raised from the dead. And you were raised from the dead. And you gave your church a commission to go into all the world and preach the good news. But now we see you. They saw you disappear into heaven in a cloud. But John saw you decades later. On the Isle of Patmos, he saw you where you are now. Revelation 1. He saw you as Isaiah saw you. He saw you as Ezekiel saw you. And what a profound effect that had. Lord, we need a profound effect. And for that profound effect, we need a profound understanding of exactly who you are. And for that to happen, we need you to open our eyes. So we pray as Paul prayed. That you, the father of glory. The father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That you would grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. We would know the hope of our calling. And your glorious riches of your inheritance and the saints. And the greatness of your power that is in us and for us. As you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead. Father, open our eyes. That there might be a response. A further response. Of obedience. That you might be able to get a people. That you died and rose again to produce in this planet. To make known the knowledge of God. That the whole world can be full of the knowledge of God. The glory of God. So Lord for this church. And indeed every church in the UK. We pray that out of your unending mercy. That you would cause us. All of us. To have an encounter with you. That we can properly respond to you. In Jesus name. Just one last thing I felt the Lord told me to do. When I was at conference. Was to pray the benediction over you. I felt the Holy Spirit say. I want you to start doing that. Because I want to. I want to bless it. I want to fulfill my word in that benediction. Do you know what I mean? This, this benediction. Aaron prayed it over the people. Let me pray it over you. The Lord bless you. And keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. Amen. And amen. God bless you.